I don't typically deal with tuner cars, but I'm gonna make an exception here because if you're in America, you can't have that. You know why? Because there's a 25 year limit on imports from Japan. So what do you do? Well, you make your own. And that's what we're gonna talk about with this 1998 RSTI. Now, I am not a Subaru fanboy. In fact, I'm not a fanboy for any car manufacturer anymore. They all have their pros and cons, but we've had this discussion. The vehicles from the late 90s and early 2000s, namely from a performance perspective, were a lot more simple, more analog, lightweight, and that's what this is. You can just take a look at the dimensions of the front of this car. It looks so tiny compared to the modern cars of today. Now, you might be wondering about the technical specs. Don't worry, we're gonna cover that in the shop in great detail because there is so much to talk about with this masterpiece. Now, my associate Jack Singapore flew all the way in from Ames, Iowa to Illinois, and it took about 20 minutes to fly in here, and he described the way this front, the way this whole car's been put together is it's the greatest hits from the late 90s, early 2000s, and I'm gonna leave it at that. The owner of this vehicle also owns a shop in Ames, Iowa called Phase Garage. He's a mechanical engineer, and he wanted to build this vehicle because he's in love with simplicity in late 90s vehicles or Japanese vehicles. He's kind of moved on from this and went into the world of the S2000 because it's even more simple. But in terms of this car, that was his whole design philosophy. How to make it original, how to make it more of a sleeper, and also not totally in your face while being dead nuts reliable on the track and on the street. It's not overly tuned, overly aggressive. You can drive it every day, and that's exactly what has been done with this. And it's proof positive from traveling out here, driving it around. It's just, it just feels so unique compared to all the modern cars I get into. Now, if you're Japanese in 1998, you would have had the GC8 STI, but unfortunately that wasn't available here. So this is a 2.5 RS that has been heavily converted into that. You look at the exterior of the Subaru and you think to yourself, I'm gonna fall asleep. This has gotta be the most boring paint color ever. But the reality is this is a fresh coat. It's been redone front to back, factory fresh. And if you're a Subaru fanatic, you might be wondering what paint color this is. Well, let me tell you, it's from a 2008-2009 Honda S2000, chicane silver to be specific. And you might think that's blasphemy, but it's not because the owner of this vehicle obviously has been inspired by another brand. Look at this wing, my God. You know, I feel like Subaru started this silliness and it really doesn't look that bad now, especially when you compare it to an abomination like the Civic Type R's wing. I know, don't hate me, I know it makes downforce, whatever. When you get in here, just take a look at it. It's got plenty of space. This is totally usable, I'm not even being sarcastic. It makes a car like this with all-wheel drive, practicality, even more practical. You can put all your crap in here. You can use this as an everyday vehicle. You can put your trinkets, your uh, dead Evo owners, pretty much anything that you can think of, it'll fit. Oh man, I could see myself ripping some Primo cotton in here. First and foremost, you're gonna check out this interior space, and damn, this is why we love the 90s. There is absolutely no horse shit, no fluff, no fake carbon fiber, no shiny bits, but this car's been modified with the Nardi Torino wheel. It feels a lot more sporty, more race-inspired. Now, I don't think the wheel's my taste because the whole car feels totally factory aside from this with the exception of these Innovate Motorsports gauges, which are extremely practical. You have a boost gauge, you have an E85 gauge that tells you your fuel quality. So that's another thing we'll get into. You have an oil pressure gauge, and then of course you have an STI gauge swap in here. Now these STI seats, in terms of their age, the design is really good, all fabric, the bolsters are extremely firm, yet giveable. You, most body types will fit in here, which is really impressive. The center stack design is about as simple and also pretty cheap. I mean, it's exactly what you'd expect from a 90s vehicle. It even has a Pioneer head unit that looks like you pulled it out of the Walmart discount bin for 25 cents. But it's all, it, everything aligns in here perfectly to what your expectations are. Now, you might wonder, well, this is for older people that 
just are reliving the 90s. And I beg to differ because there's enough teenage boys that are going to be spilling seed to, to get in here and really get their hands on this. Now, that's not a knock because the reality is this car generates excitement. And why is that? When you could buy a brand new STI. But the thing is, there's something special about these cars that's lost. There, there's just so much personality that's lost in modern cars that's all here. It just feels good. It looks good. It's just a classic Japanese design at this point. Now, simplicity aside, there's been a ton changed from a standard 2.5 RS or an STI. And only in the shop can we cover so much of that. So let's take a look. How you doing? Now that we have the Subaru on the Ben Pack lift, I'd like to introduce a special guest. And no, it's not Turbowski because he's too busy yet again having breakfast in bed with whoever he's having breakfast in bed with. But I'm going to bring in Jack Singapore. He's an associate of mine. He's been in videos, but never formally introduced. Jack, how good, are we doing today? Good to see you, Mark. Good it's, to see uh, you. I've came, come all the way from Ames and brought... Uh, Mrs. Goose's little boy, a very special gift. Oh yeah, what's that? Uh, Phase Garage's very own shop car. It's a uh, GC8 RSTI. Okay. Now, let's get into the nuts and bolts of all this because there's a ton of cover. Yeah. So now that we've looked over this car front to back, I just have to ask, why would the owner go through all of this and, and how did he start this project? So as you may know, the the U.S. market never got a late 90s, early 2000 SDI. So this was the owner's attempt, Shane at Phase Garage's attempt to build one here in the U.S. So this car began life as a 1998 RS Coupe. In fact, it was an automatic RS Coupe. Okay. He then uh, brought it to his shop. He stripped it down to the nuts and bolts, basically bare frame and chassis. Why did he choose the 98 RS? He wanted a, well... That, so the U.S. never got the STI, but we did get the body, and okay. that was the RS. Okay. So he what, he picked a low mileage, like really clean chassis he to found build the, off of? Yeah, he found the cleanest one he could find in the country. So it happened to be a one-owner one in all places North Dakota that never saw snow. So okay. he then from there imported the front half of a JDM uh, Generation 8 STI. Motor and trans and rear and front subframes. Okay, now that we know some of the background of this car, when you look at the front end, this is all Gen 8 STI, Japanese spec. The lower control arms, the subframe, the hubs, the knuckles, the axles, all of that is from a Japanese car into the US market RS. Now, there were some things that Shane did to this car that really surprised me. What, what is that? So the biggest weakness of this generation of Subaru is chassis rigidity. Okay. So what Shane did is he seam welded this car as well as filled the body rails, or the frame rails, pardon me, with polyurethane foam. The seam welds essentially add immense rigidity to all the weak points in the car, and the polyurethane foam also acts as a rigidity agent as well as a sound denting material. Okay. And one of the things that we're going to talk about with 90s cars, while there's a level of simplicity to them, one of the big downfalls is, namely in this generation, Subaru has increased the body structure of this car over the generation of the Impreza and the WRX by probably 400% compared to where it was now versus where it is today, or I'm sorry, where it was yesterday compared to today. And that's one of the reasons why, obviously, he seamwalled it. You can't make up for that, and that's the only way you can kind of fix some of the issues with it. Yeah, this was definitely a no expense spare build. Okay. This is not something somebody, your typical enthusiast, would do. No, this is not something you do in your backyard. Okay. Now to the untrained eye, you might look at this and think, oh, this is just looks like a regular Subaru swap. And there's little details that you pick up on, like the spherical end links for the sway bar in the front. You have white line ball joints at the lower control arm and the tie rod ends. You have Gen 7 STI Brembo brakes in the front and in the rear. There's just things all over here from the header wrap to the exhaust wrap to the heat rejection or material to the alloy-based uh, 
you know, subframe mounts with polyurethane inserts, there's things here to increase performance, rigidity, and this is what you get in with tuner cars. Kind of, once you open the door, you know the sky's the limit, and a lot of that is here. The other thing you're gonna notice about the front of this vehicle is the other aftermarket parts, like the Mishimoto accessories, the silicone hoses for the radiator, the heat rejection wrap, and then this sandwich plate style oil cooler from Mishimoto. Now, with this type of style, there's no thermostat in it. It's always flowing oil to the cooler. So during cold starts, well, you're, you're still, you're cooling the oil when you don't need to. So that's something to note. The other thing is trying to run oil cooler lines on a car that wasn't designed for it. And you can see here, these stainless braided lines are butted up right against the header, up against the subframe. So it's one of these things you have to monitor that you typically wouldn't have to monitor with an OEM car to make sure you're not getting any oil seepage or leakage. And there's some oil seepage here from above and some of the oil filter spots, but it's, it's nothing major, but you would want to keep an eye on these lines. We are in the back, Jack. Sorry to rhyme, but... This is your favorite place to be, right? It the is. The back of any automobile? I love the back. The with, back some, uh, with some thick pipe? That's some serious thick pipe, and it looks like a straight-up fart can exhaust, but it, it's a Blitz exhaust. And, and to your surprise, it's pretty quiet. It's unbelievably quiet, and I think that this sets off the tone of the whole build, whole build for me, and I think when I looked at it the first time, like this is pretty mature for kind of a tuner car. Yeah, what you expect with most Subarus, particularly STIs with swap motors and all this other nonsense, is you expect it to be a Vapro car. You expect big power, no reliability, and a lot of nonsense. And what FaZe did with this car is they wanted something that you could drive to the track, post stellar lap times, and then come home and have little or no issues. You've got no cooling problems, you have no oil pressure issues. You've, it's been thought through. Okay. Now, you know, some people are not going to agree. And that, this is the part with tuner cars. You're going to argue about, well, why did they do this? Why did they do this? You could make 500 horsepower. Why would you do, you know, you're going to have this endless argument about what's the best choice. And that's the whole thing about tuner cars is it's an individual choice. But that's what's what we talk focus? about all the time, though, is what's important to you, right? Right. You and I, and I hope most people, the most important thing is, okay, yeah, you post a great lot of time, you have a good day. But you've got to go home and you don't have to worry about your car's broken or all right, that. Right, you don't nonsense. have to fix a ton of shit. And I think that gets more uh, to be more of an issue with people as they get older. You don't have as much time to dick around. Maybe you do, but most of us don't have time to sit here, oh God, now I got to fix this every time I get done beating on it. And you can tell most of this is OEM. There, again, a lot of this is OEM swap. You have a Gen, Gen, Gen 7, 7. Rear, rear end. You have this, the OEM differential. You have the, the OEM DCCD controller. Yeah, from a Gen 7 STI. And like anything else on this car, it was built to be the strongest seemingly possible and had shorter ratios as well. So. Okay. Jack, we made it under the hood of this STI. And what do we have here? This is a EJ207 motor. It came straight from Japan. It is a JDM exclusive motor that came out of the Generation 8 GC8 STI. Okay. So is this a stock motor? From yeah, yeah. From the factory, it revved to 8250, which is way higher than any US STI. And it still motor. revs to 8250? Still revs to 8250. However, this has been tuned by a gentleman named Graham Gaylord at Boosted Performance here in the Midwest on E85. So it makes about 350 wheel horsepower. Okay. So what's the what's, what's kind of the fine print of running E? I see there's a Cobb flex fuel kit in here, so it's obviously set up to run 91 octane as well, right? Yeah, it's a flex fuel. It has larger uh, uh, injectors from Injector Dynamics and a, a upgraded fuel pump from Deutschwerk. Okay, so you could run 91 in you here. You could, but what's the power up? What do you, what do you lose? You lose between 60 and 80 wheel horsepower when you switch. To really, 91. that much? It's pretty substantial. Okay. Uh, so there are some negative side effects of running E85, and there's certain parts of the U.S. where you're stuck from a tuning perspective running E85 because gas quality, like in California and Arizona, are pitiful. It's and dreadful. The, the 91's like 80 or 99 In Iowa, it's the same way. Tuners will tell you Iowa's 91 is more like 87 than okay. the rest of the country. So that makes sense why you would run it here uh, to get the extra power. There's added knock resistance to it. and Cooling benefits as well. E85 does burn cooler. The con, and we like talking about, you know, nothing, nothing's free, particularly when it comes to cars. Yeah. Gas mileage. Gas mileage, and you have to change your oil more often. Which... Okay. And the gas mileage is significantly worse. It's like your, your fuel economy goes down into the teens. So while it's great for performance, you know, that's like, 
that we we talked about this in the early 2000s how ethanol was like supposed to be the savior but it's really very wasteful because you you just your fuel economy goes in the toilet if you want to make peak power you got to run e85 if you want to be safe on the track you should run e85 but from a daily driving perspective there would be nothing wrong running this thing on 91 or 93. okay well that's cool that it's an option other than that, there's just a host of little changes here. You have a Mishimoto catch can, which there doesn't seem to be much in it, but it's not baffled, so who knows. You have Perrin uh, silicone hoses, Mishimoto silicone hoses, more heat rejection. You have a strut tower bar. You have your adjustable dampers and camber plates. You have a Koyo radiator, and uh, you can see your oil cooler lines running in the engine bay. But other than that, what do you, is there anything else done? No, we tried to make this as close to a JDM SDI as possible. And hopefully, I mean, as we've discovered on the track, all the reliability of a OEM car. Okay. Well, let's take this on the road and see how it drives and see if there's any weirdness. It's still a tuner car to me. So if it drives good, we'll find out. Now normally in a regular sports car, namely rear wheel drive, I might be a little bit fr afraid in these conditions, but let's see how it does in some of the turns. Still have to be a little careful, uh, very careful. I'm on summer tires and extreme cold. Man, this thing is just, it's crazy. For, you know, you're, you're expecting to lose grip you do but the all-wheel drive system is incredible at keeping the power down and it's like it's <laughs> I guess I'm so scared of the rear end breaking loose but it never does and I think that's the biggest thing about this car is it always puts its power down in all the conditions and that's why you buy a Subaru Now let's be real, this is a tuner car. Most of it's OEM, but you have tuning. You have the E85 aspect of it. Uh, you have the cold weather, you have track brake pads, you have summer tires. And you know, I hear quirks, rattles, creaks. I smell a little bit of oil burning. The shifter doesn't feel perfect, but you know what? I feel everything that's going on in this car. The visibility is incredible. I don't have pillars blocking me. I feel so connected with this car. Somebody said, well, you know, 90s cars, they're, they're not as safe. And that's true, they're not as safe. If I take an offset collision, I'm probably dead. Uh, you know, the chassis rigidity isn't what it is on an, a modern Subaru or a modern sports car. And that's very true as well. Uh, but a lot of these trade-offs, you know, I always use that word visceral. This car has a ton of character and you feel everything. So we're going to take this and see what the straight line acceleration is. Now I'm in the wet, it's 34 degrees out and I'm on summer tires. But this should be a really good example of how this car gets off the line. Uh, now it does have launch control which I'm not going to use because it's insane. But let's take a look from a normal street start. Whoa. man <laughs> you feel like you're going Mach 3 and then Nine one one, where's your emergency? Yeah, nine one one. It's Subaru WRX fan. I cut myself shaving again. Oh. Yeah.
70 kilometers an hour. I don't even want to do the math, but in this car, with how much road noise there is, with how visceral it is, it feels like you're going about 300 miles an hour. Now there's only so much fun you can have on a street, but this is proof positive why there's so many Subaru fans out there, Evo fans, or all-wheel drive, four-wheel drive people, because you can put down the power. I couldn't even drive one-tenth that speed in a rear-wheel drive car with summer tires on it, and in this vehicle, it is zero issue. Now there is some weirdness with the DCCD system. If I put the bias towards the front, it doesn't seem to like it. I always have to see, I always have to kind of keep it towards the rear, and then there's no issue with it at all. Um, but overall, you know, I think if you're looking at this from a di daily driving perspective, ah, I don't know that I would do it. It's kind of like vintage, but you could if you wanted to. It's noisy, it doesn't ride the best. Uh, you know, it's not the safest platform out there anymore, but the, the levels of joy that you have driving it make up for a lot of that. You know, I, I think I would make this a second car. So if you're looking at a vehicle like this, there's a lot of potential here. If you don't go overboard, you can make it pretty reliable if you're willing to accept some of the faults of having a tuner car and some of the bugs that go along with it. Final thoughts on the Subaru RSTi or whatever you wanna call it. After spending some time with this car, I thought, it's so apparent how much has changed in the past 20 years in the performance car market. If you want a high revving motor, you're pretty much have to go to a car like the Mustang Shelby GT350, a Porsche GT3, or a Ferrari 488. I mean, that's really the only thing like the way that this Subaru is tuned. Now you could go back with the RX-8 or the S2000, but really in the modern age, that's gone. And that's one of the best parts about this RSTi. And I think the other part is it's tuned really well, assuming you're running E85 or I'm sorry, E50, which is what was in the car. It's just unbelievable how much fun you can have with it. Now, a lot of the pros and cons are still there from a Subaru platform, namely one that's 20 years old. You know, they did a lot of work on the chassis with the seam welding, and it doesn't feel like a total rubber band like the, you know, like the original car did, but it still just doesn't have that level of solidity. The steering is not there in terms of directness like modern cars are. Uh, braking is, you know, kind of hit or miss, but the best thing about it is the all-wheel drive system. It is amazing how much it is able to put down its power not only that, to transfer the power to the rear, to still have a rear bias to it, it, it's so much fun to operate. Now, from a tuner car perspective, this is a tuner car. We never had this vehicle in the US. And you know, you still have some of the niggles and wiggles you have to deal with with a tuner car. You know, there's some oil leaking, the, the transmission, transmission feel isn't really all that great and probably could use some adjustment. And I personally, wouldn't keep the dampers that are on that car. I would get rid of those flex dampers and go to something else that was better on the street and a little bit more, a little bit more control without just feeling like it was always at the end of its stroke. So that's something to look at. But overall, this car was just, it shows you how good cars were in the late 90s. It really does. It's almost transcendent. They were so ahead of their time with the regulations, with all the crap that we have in modern cars it's almost set us backwards. You can't get into a car that feels this raw anymore. Your turbocharged cars run out of steam at you know near the red line. You don't typically see a car that revs over 7,000 RPMs anymore in the affordable price bracket. And that's what makes this Subaru what, what it is. And if you're looking to buy this or you wanna know more about this vehicle, just contact FaZe Garage. I'm gonna put their contact information here, ask them questions, call them. And if you wanna buy it, I'm sure it's for sale. So with that said, hope you enjoyed this. See you next time.